Welcome to Trademark versus Copyright and Protecting Your Brand. My name is Paola Mendez and I am the founder of the Blogger Union. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Blogger Union, the Blogger Union is a network of blogger communities across the US. And our goal is to help our members grow their brands and incomes through educational meetups, workshops, and webinars, just like this one. Um, and today we are going to be talking with Serena Minot, and she is uh, an attorney who specializes in trademarking. And she's going to tell us all, she's also an author. She writes children's books, which I just find out about, <laughs> and is an entrepreneur. She started flatfeettrademark.com, and I'm going to let her tell us a little bit more about herself. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you. I'm just kind of scrolling through so I can see some of the cameras here. Uh, yeah, I'm Serena. Thank you, Paula, for inviting me to talk to your group. Uh, this is the second time that we've met and spoken together, uh, albeit now under very different circumstances. So <laughs> thanks for having me. As Paula said, I am an attorney, entrepreneur, and author, but my main day job is as a trademark attorney. I've been practicing trademark law since longer than I care to admit. Um, <laughs> 2002 when I first started my legal career and I set up my own practice in 2007. I moved to South Florida from DC and said hi to all the DMV folks. <laughs> set up my own firm in 2007. So this is our 13th year. We're super excited about it. We practice intellectual property law, primarily trademarks and some copyright work and also transactional business law. If you're based in Florida, we can provide some guidance on the transactional aspects of organizing and running a business as well. As Paula mentioned, I'm also an author. I write children's books and uh, that's pretty much it. I do some other stuff, but those are the important <laughs> today. You do so many things. Welcome. We're so excited to hear all of your insights because I, for one, I know about um, licensing my images and um, and getting my trademark, but just in general, I'm not quite sure what exactly is intellectual property and how would it apply for a content creator like all of us, if you could please tell us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And just so everyone knows, I did put some um, slides with some of the information that we'll share today in the resource guide. Uh, so Paula has that available through the website. Um, and so you can access some of the information we'll talk about today through the resource guide. Oh, so, so, uh, so and if you have a question, feel free to just, you know, give us a hand wave, drop us a note in the comments and I'll be sure to address your questions. Um, yes. As we yes. If you have a question, then, uh, feel free to, um, leave it in the chat and we will address it. And if you give me one second, Serena, uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. Lovely. When we talk about intellectual property, right, we're really talking about three buckets, if you want to think about it that way. So we have on in one trademarking, in the second we have copyrights, and in the third we have patents. Really all intellectual property tends to fall into one of these three categories. Okay. So when we talk about intellectual property for content creators, we're usually talking about the first two most times, right? So trademarking and copyrights. What's the difference? That's the biggest question. You know, I have clients who call, they're like, I want to copyright something when they really want to trademark something. So when we talk about trademarking, we're talking about your brand name. So Paula, for you, this would be the blogger union. Uh, or for me, it would be Flappy Trademark. Uh, so when we talk about trademarks, this is the brand name by which customers find your products or services in the marketplace. So it's your Nike, your Google, your McDonald's, your Facebook, you know, these are brand names. Uh, and what we talk about, we talk about trademarks, intellectual property. When we talk about copyrights, and this is also really relevant for content creators, we're talking about original works of authorship. Um, so we're talking about, uh, you know, photographs, musical composition, compositions, written works, uh, drawings, illustrations, songs, anything that you create is subject to copyright protection. So okay. if you're a photographer, if you're an artist, if you're a musician, these are all things that are subject to copyright protection. Uh, so, so those are the, the, the third are patents, which are original inventions. Um, so not as relevant, but if you're a tinkerer out there and you draw and then you make things, you could potentially also be interested in patent 
protection, which protects original inventions. It has to be an actual device or something useful that you have created. I see. Not simply an idea. <laughs> so I think, um, I think for trademarks, like if I want to um, trademark my logo or my brand, um, how would I go about doing that? How do you go about doing that? Right. So that is the clearest and simplest definition of both terms I've ever heard. Well, thank you, Mark. <laughs> uh, so there are, there are a couple different things with both, right? So let's talk first about trademarks. Okay. In the U.S., you can establish rights in your trademark either by being the first to use a mark in the marketplace or the first to file. And when we say file, we mean to file a federal trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So just by nature of using your trademark, for example, we'll just keep using blogger unions as everyone's familiar with it, right? So just by nature of using blogger union, you're establishing rights in that name. So whatever the name of your blog is or your website or your products, if you're selling products, you are, you're establishing rights just by nature of using it and offering it to potential consumers in the marketplace. The other way and the way that my firm assists clients is through federal trademark protection. It's essentially, um, you know, kind of going legal with your trademark. So when you file for federal trademark protection, you're protected on the federal level against any potential infringement. Uh, so this means you have nationwide priority to use your name, your trademark, your slogan, your, you know, color scheme, your brand name, whatever it might be in connection with the goods or services you're offering exclusively. So no one else can open a website, a blog, a blog, anything relating to kind of what you do and use your same trademark name. So no one else could open up another blog or another website using Blogger Union, for example. I see. So okay. when you get protection on the federal level, that's really kind of a stronger tool because the issue with the use rights I talked about first, for example, with trademarks is you're only limited to the geographic region where you can show use, you know? So if you're only operating in Florida, you're only protected in that region. If you're only operating in Miami, you're only protected in Miami. Whereas if you file on the federal level, you're protected nationally. So it's kind of a big cover versus a small regional cover is really yeah. the difference. I and of course, there are accompanying rights that come with federal registration. You know, how you can sue, how much money you can get back, things like that. Oh, I see. Yeah, so when I we talk about... When, you know, when we talk about copyright, which I think is the... I mean, it would, it's great if we all trademark our brands and our names. That's definitely something. But what I think the biggest issue that we are finding as content creators is our copyright of our works. People take right. our photographs without um, our, our permission uh, or their te our text and stuff. And how would we go about to copyright our work? Right. Yeah. So copyrights work similarly, but they're slightly different in the sense that um, and I'll explain kind of how they're different in a second. So same way, you, so you get uh, copyright protection just by nature of creating something. So the minute you write a poem or you create a book or you take a photograph, you have copyright rights in that content just right off the bat. It's called a poor man's copyright. Okay. <laughs> on the flip side, you can see copyright registration with the copyright office. So just as if you would, you know, just as you would register a trademark with the federal, you know, trademark office, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, there's a federal copyright office. So it's, you know, the U.S. Copyright Office, you can file your copyrights there. One of the benefits of <laughs> registering your copyright is that you're able to sue. It's very difficult to sue on a poor man's copyright. Oh. Um, so the right to bring a, tra a copyright infringement lawsuit, it does require you to have a federally registered copyright. Um, so you may have heard that you can mail yourself something in the mail to establish the date in which you wrote something. So there are a few different ways that you can kind of create a paper trail for your poor man's copyright. But the best way really is just to pay the filing fee or to pay an attorney to file your copyright for you with the Federal Copyright Office. Well, okay, great. So we are getting the question in the chat and is how much does it cost to copyright your work uh, or trademark or get your trademark? Sure. Um, so. It, it, it varies widely, obviously, you know, depending on if you're going to do it yourself, if you're going to work with an attorney. Uh, our firm charges a flat fee to, you know, trademark uh, and also to do copyright. So it can range from, you know, thousands of dollars to hundreds of dollars if you're going to work through an attorney. If you are going to file by yourself or on your own, I will say that the trademark office filing fee is $275 per class. And that's the standard filing fee. When I say per class, trademarks are organized into classes. So every product or service falls into a particular class. Uh, 
classes, 45 different classes. So if you want protection for clothing, that's one class. If you want protection for, you know, blogging and website services, that's the second class. So you pay the government filing fee for each of those classes that you want protection in. Our legal fee is 475 if you're gonna pay an attorney. So that just gives you an idea of how much you can kind of budget for, for example, you know, 500 bucks, you know, 475, 500 bucks. Of course, your attorneys will charge you $2,000. It really just depends on who you're working with. And you can maybe go to LegalZoom and pay, I think like 195 or something, but they're right. not attorney. You just have to really shop around and find the service that works best for you. Right. But uh, just in my personal experience, getting my trademark I actually use Serena, <laughs> so flat free trademark <laughs> service. And let me tell you, I'm so glad. There is, I was trying to do it, but I always try DIY first, see what am I getting myself into. There are so many categories. I didn't know what category to put my stuff under that it was just a blessing to be able to, to do it with you guys. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad that we were able to help you. Uh, Portia asks, is that per month or a one-time fee? It's a one-time fee. And I'll get to copyrights in one second. I know that's really important to the, uh, the people who are listening in. So trademarks, once you get your trademark registered, it's valid for 10 years. And so you file your first renewal after the first five to six years after your registration date. And so you pay one renewal you know, between years five and six. And then your next renewal is due between years nine and 10. Once you're at the 10-year mark, then you renew every 10 years. So to answer LaPorsche's question, it's a one-time fee to register your trademark, and then you file your renewals every, every five years in the first 10 years and every 10 years thereafter. Okay, great. And so, so the copyright fees are similar. We charge $325 for a copyright registration. The government fee is quite different. I said it was $275 for a trademark. On the copyright side, it's only $40 or $35. Oh, okay. But that's for like every single picture? Yeah, so it's per image, yeah. So it's, you know, per work. Um, right. So but it is possible if you have a collection of works to file that as one collective work. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so do you, would it be possible to do, say, all of the photos it, that are currently on my blog, do you think you'd be able to put that under one collection? Ah, uh, if they... If, if they're gathered, they have to be gathered into one medium. And so, you know, each of the photographs on your website, because it's a website, they're on separate pages, you'll likely have to treat, copyright those separately. Okay. Um, so you talk about being able to copyright all the images together. It's a collection of photographs in one medium, for example, in a book or something. Okay. So we're getting a little bit more specific questions about trademarking. So I'm just going to insert these. If we get derailed too much, because we have a bunch of really good questions lined up for you guys, uh, we'll just push the questions to the end, but let's see how far we can get with these. So someone said, can they initial um, their name or can they trademark their initials or a name as a brand name? Right, absolutely. You can really trademark most things. I won't say everything, but most things are subject to trademark protection. Obviously there are some restrictions on things that just are not trademarkable. Um, you know, whether it's not distinctive enough, um, and even there used to be a rule against trademarking things that were offensive or disparaging, and even that rule has been thrown out in the last couple of years. But you can certainly trademark your name, your initials, you can trademark a sound, you can trademark a layout of a store. For example, the Apple Store is trademarked. Oh. Um, a lot of people probably know that the Absolute Vodka Bottle is trademarked, so you can trademark anything. If you are trademarking your own personal name or someone else's name, you are going to need a written authorization. Uh, if it's a living person, this is obviously to protect regular everyday folks from trademarking Beyonce or LeBron James. Right. You, know, you have to have written authorization from the named person before you can protect their name. But if it's your own name, you can just, you know, obviously give consent and it's easy peasy. Oh, okay. Good to know. Um, so someone's asking, which we were going to talk about that a little later, but let's just talk about it now. Can you take legal action uh, against a brand using your content without your permission, even if you're using their product? Is it worth the trouble? Right. Yeah, so one of the things that I, I did, lost my point, we talked about copyrights. I said there was a big difference with copyrights versus trademarks. So trademarks, right, because they're brand names, they're things that we just kind of come up with and say, hey, I'm gonna call my brand Google, or I'm gonna call my brand the Blogger Union. When it comes to copyrights, it's a little bit more nuanced, right? Because that's original content that you're creating. It's, there's a, it's, a high, it's highly unlikely that someone's going to write the same exact poem as you or someone's going to you know, create the same exact 
you know, content on a website page as what you created, right? So it's very difficult to say, hey, you just randomly came up with that same paragraph that I wrote or that same exact photograph that I took, right? So it's a little bit easier to parse when something is your original content that you created versus something that is a coincidence you have in the same brand name as someone else. Um, so you can absolutely take legal action against a brand that is using your content without your permission because you do have a copyright in the content even if you haven't registered. Now, as I said, it is difficult to bring that type of a lawsuit, but it is possible for you to bring it, um, you know, in a state court, for example, a state, a state action. Uh, whether or not it's gonna worth, be worth your cost to do that um, is a different question. You know, anytime you have to bring a lawsuit, obviously there's legal fees that are gonna be involved for the court costs. You'll really have to figure out what is the damage to you versus, you know, what is gonna cost you to bring that legal action. Um, but you can absolutely bring legal action against anyone that's using your materials without permission. Uh, it's just whether or not it's going to be worth your while. Okay. And then of course, when we talk about social media, then that's a different issue, but we might get into that later because, you know, if you're reposting, people are reposting your photographs, for example, on social media, you've generally, you know, you've pretty much given up the rights for, for them to be able to do that. So. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? If you post something on social media, uh, <laughs> You see this all the time where people will repost images that are posted on social media, they will repost memes, because once you post that content, you've essentially given up the rights to claim any exclusive rights to be the only person to post that image. Really? Oh, so that is news to me. I did not know that once I post my photo on Instagram, then anyone has fair game to use it without Correct. my consent? Within, within Instagram. Within Instagram. Within Instagram. Yes. Uh, okay, question. Uh, what about if they are using my photo within Instagram, but they're using it to sell like as an ad within Instagram without right. my consent? Right. Well, you do have, you do have rights to your likeness. And so if you wanted to bring an action against them, a state action for privacy rights, you do have privacy rights to be able to use, you know, to have your image associated with something that you're either not endorsing or not affiliated with then you would have rights to be able to, to, to um, enforce that action against them for that use of your likeness. I see. Okay. I, can, uh, I, could, I couldn't just take a picture of Beyonce again. I'll use Beyonce because she's so famous <laughs> and put it on my, you know, new line of shampoos and advertise it because obviously everyone has a right to their privacy and their likeness for commercial gain. Most times you yeah, repost on Instagram, it's not for commercial gain. But th there is that nuance about like, if a brand is taking a photo that you took of their product that you post on your social media, right? Um, and th they, it's their advertising channels. So there is some, so some, some monetary gain there. It's like, they're using it for advertising. So is there, do you have a, some ground to stand there or no? <laughs> No, I, I don't think you'd have a leg to stand on there because you posted the picture again. It's now in, it's now, you know, you post a picture with their product that you're using. They want to, you know, screenshot that and repost it on their page. It's going to be fair game with Instagram. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, what about if it's not on social media, but on your website? Then you're getting into a copyright infringement matter. Oh, I see. Yes. Wow. Okay. And so you'll see this all the time where people will just kind of go to the internet and they'll pull an image off of something. And there were a few cases that were happening a few years ago with Getty. And Getty images really aggressive in enforcing their copyrights where people were just kind of grabbing images, web designers grabbing images off of the internet, putting them on people's websites, you know, web designers in particular. And then Getty had to get very aggressive to enforce these copyrights because people were using those images without permission to build that website. And a lot of times the end client, you know, who paid the web developer had no idea that these images were on license. So. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So. Hey, so, so Chris Malcolm just gave a, a comment to the same, to the same point here that we just talked about on social media. So uh, that is a uh, breaking news for me. <laughs> That once you post your photographs on social media, then you're kind of giving up your rights for people to use it all over social media, at least without your consent. So um, let's talk about valuing. Okay, let's say someone is going to take your work from your website. You didn't share it on social media, so you still have your copyright. How would you go about valuing your work? 
like for copyright, for licensing, um, right. or even, uh, you know, you, how to value your brand. If maybe uh, uh, some other brand is trying to come and ask you to, you know, uh, you use your brand in their line of sunglasses, for example. So let's say they want to start the Crow Gables Love line of sunglasses. How would I even go about to about, uh, figuring out the value of my brand and my images? Right. Well, that's a really challenging, you know, it's, it's every time we talk about figuring out damages and how much, you know, that you'd be able to get if you were to bring a suit, it really comes down to whether or not there were damages incurred, right? So if it were, whether lost profits or lost business for you, you know, that was diverted, for example, if someone, you know, starts selling counterfeit goods that then takes away from your sales and you can prove that direct connection, you can obviously sue for damages in that sense. Uh, if you're unable to prove your own damages, you could obviously then prove the potential defendant's profits. Um, so it really comes down to being able to prove how much they were able to monetize what they took from you using your content, your photograph, your name, what have you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there's statutory damages as well that, you know, the court would be obligated to follow based on what's in the law. But in terms of you kind of getting a ballpark idea of what would be available to you, it's looking at either your actual damages that were sustained or the, the, uh, the potential defendant's profits. So that's great advice. Thank you. How about when you're trying to figure out how to charge when it's an amicable situation and they genuinely just want to license your images, for example? Right. And yeah. So let's really talk uh, very quickly about licensing. So when we talk about licensing, you always, 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 I cannot stress this enough. You have to get it in writing. You have got to have your licensing arrangement in writing to really outline the, the parameters of the term, the compensation, uh, you know, your ability to review the books in terms of how your image was used on how many products and how many units were sold. So you have to be able to, you know, have the parameters, how, how the licensing arrangement is going to work. Um, so when we talk about licensing and how much to charge, you know, it's really just one, it's going to vary for every situation. There's no one size fits all when it comes to this. You know, if you're licensing, if you have an audience of, you know, 5 million people and there's someone who comes to you and they're like, Hey, I want to use, you know, Coral Gables Love to, you know, sell a line of sunglasses. That's going to look very different than someone who has 500 followers and they want to use, you know, that blog or that person's likeness on a line of something else. So mm -hmm. it really depends on what is the value that you're bringing to them and really what you're able to negotiate. Um, so it's really a question of, you know, what you're willing to accept and what the licensor is willing to pay. So there really is no set margins on, you know, how to value your things. Okay. But if you think about it, you know, there are kind of standard guidelines on, you know, kind of standard licensing percentages. I would say that between, you know, anywhere from three to 10% is not unreasonable. Um, but you can perhaps negotiate more. Okay. Um, thank when I say you. three to percent, I mean a royalty. So, you know, on, you know, the per item sold, uh, this is, this is a percentage of uh, royalty payments. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> so we have a few more questions, of, of, again, about trademarking. Um, someone is asking, is it a good idea for me to file the trademark on my own or should I get help? This is going to vary by person. You know, if you're someone who really doesn't mind getting down in the weeds and figuring things out yourself and kind of going through the process and keeping up with everything, by all means, I would say, go ahead and give it a go yourself. Um, but I will say that the trademark process uh, is a little bit more raw and complex than, for example, copyrights. Um, copyrights are pretty straightforward. Again, by nature of, of copyrights being original content, it's more unusual that someone would have created and copywritten the same exact thing that you have created and are trying to copyright. When it comes to trademarks, we see similar names all the time and no two brands can have the same name for similar products or services. Uh, so when it comes to trademarks, it can be a minefield to be quite honest. I mean, even as a trademark attorney, you know, there are quite a few different angles uh, and pitfalls that could happen in any given trademark application. Um, so if you're someone who's a real DIYer, you want to give it a shot, it's not impossible. You know, you can cut your own hair, you can <laughs> finish a criminal trial. Um, but I think working with a lawyer definitely does help because especially if they're an experienced attorney, 
we kind of know what to look for and what the pitfalls falls are to give you a heads up ahead of time before you invest your money and potentially lose it if something goes wrong. Because that's right. If you file for a trademark, right? You, yeah. you want to trademark your name and you go through, you file by yourself uh, and you didn't do the research and there's already someone who trademarked that exact name, they will not give you the trademark and you lose your filing fees, right? Exactly. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. There's no refunds. Once you file your trademark, there are no refunds. So um, th that's the good thing about using a service like Serena's because they do a search and they tell you, you know, these are potential uh, problems that you might encounter while you're filing your, your trademark. Right. Um, with more information to know, you know what the potential risks are and if it's someone that you're willing to take or not. Absolutely. Anastasia is asking, how long does it take to trademark a brand? And sure. what sort of information do you need? Yeah. So the standard trademark timeline is eight to 12 months. This is the standard U.S. Patent and Trademark Office timeline. There is no ex expedited route. Uh, this is just a standard trademark time. Really, the application sits for about the first four months. It really just sits there until it's assigned to an examiner at the trademark office. Um, so it takes about eight to 12 months. Keep in mind, you don't have to wait until you get your trademark to start using your mark. Tons of clients and tons of people file their trademarks, you know, that have already been in use. You can file it as in use, which means you're already up and running. You have your website, you have your products, you have your labels, you have your blog, and you're in use, you can file that way. All right, it's still gonna be eight to 12 months. You can also file as intent to use. So even if you don't yet have your product, or you haven't yet started your website, but you love the name, you wanna lock it in before you get set up, you wanna make sure it's going to be trademarkable or it's going to be you know, allowed trademark registration, you can start the process early through what's called an intent to use application. The two processes are pretty much the same up to a point. The intent to use application, however, at about the six month mark, the trademark office will issue a provisional approval to say, hey, this application has been approved, but we now need to see how you're using it in commerce. So just so everyone knows, the trademark office will not allow registration until you can show that you are actually offering your products in the marketplace. So the admin, but you can file extensions of time to show you. So let's say you file, but you're not ready in six months, you're not ready in a year. You can file extensions of time to keep the application active, but they won't allow it to be registered until you can show, here's my website, here's my blog, here's my brochure, my signage, whatever. I see. Um, so oh. eight to 12 months is a short answer. <laughs> it takes quite a while to get your trademark. So if you, if you know what your brand is and you love it, you might as well get started. <laughs> Yeah, and the information really quickly, you know, we need to know what's the trademark you want to protect, what types of products and services are you offering, who's going to be the trademark owner, you know, what's your nationality or in which state are you organized if you're a company, and then usual contact details, name, phone number, address, etc. Keep in mind, copyright and trademark information are public records, so just be aware when you're filing that the information in your file is going to be public records, and you may get a lot of spam. Oh, yes. Um, okay, George has another question. And he says, I wanted to trademark a product name, but I saw that the trademark had a current status of abandoned for about four months. Can I still continue to trademark it? Yes. Thank you, George, for the question. Um, so if it's been four months, you're probably in the green zone. You can probably go for it. It depends on what happened. You know, if it was abandoned, it was never used, it was never registered, and it's abandoned you're probably going to be in the clear because they have two months within which to redeem an abandoned application. Um, if it was a registration, you might want to wait six months. So if it was a registration that was previously held by someone that has not been canceled, which means the mark was registered, but is no longer registered, you're going to want to give it at least six months to be sure it's truly dead and not subject to being revived. Uh, the other side to George's question is even if someone has allowed their trademark to become abandoned, are canceled, it doesn't mean that they're still not using it. It just means that perhaps they let their trademark accidentally lapse or become abandoned. So someone like that could potentially bring a common law trademark lawsuit against you or common law trademark claim. So just because something is abandoned doesn't mean it's not in use by someone else. At the top of the call, we talked about trademark rights by use and trademark rights by filing. So that's right. We do okay. <laughs> So um, let's see, Felicia has a question. 
If you decide to trademark your business or name and do all the paperwork yourself, is it possible to sit with a lawyer to review for a consultation fee before submitting? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we don't really do that so much. The reason being, it's not that we're opposed to it, especially if you're willing to pay a consultation fee. Um, the reason being, it's the main issue that we want to look at when we you know, talk about trademarking is, is there a conflict in the marketplace? You know, is there a potential conflict that you're going to run into at the trademark office? And without doing a trademark search up front, me looking at your trademark application is going to be useless. I can look at it and say, okay, you did everything right. This looks fine. But if there's a conflict in the database and I don't know that, you're not going to get your trademark. So the most important step is a trademark search. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So Elizabeth has a great question. And she says, if we trademark a name, does that mean we have rights to that name on all the social media platforms that we trademark? The, for example, I, I just, I, for example, I know Coca-Cola, right? Right. Owns the trademark Coca-Cola. You can't open the Instagram Coca-Cola because that's their trademark. Would that, is that how that works? Right. So now, yeah, it doesn't quite work that way. But <laughs> now that we're, you know, this used to be the issue with domain names. You know, so clients would come to us all the time. It's like, well, I have the trademark. I must be able to get the domain. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Just because you're, you have the trademark, it doesn't mean you're entitled to that user handle. You know, someone registered that handle before you, they may charge you for it. You know, they don't have to give it to you. You know, so if you weren't the first to grab it, that's why I tell my clients all the time, you know, once you figure out your brand name, you need to get on all the, you know, platforms, your Pinterest, your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, your TikTok, whatever you're into, and get all your handles registered because someone is not obligated to give it to you just because you have the trademark. It's the same with domain names, you know, just because you have blogger union trademark doesn't mean that you get bloggerunion.com for your domain name. Um, now a wrinkle does arise with that where if you have the trademark before and then you have it registered and then someone later tries to register the handle, let's say you for some reason don't register your, your social media handles and someone does it after you filed your trademark, then you can bring a trademark infringement lawsuit against them because once you file your trademark, you're essentially putting the whole world on well, the US on constructive notice that, hey, I have a trademark claim to this name. And so everyone pretty much knows that, hey, Bar Union is powerless, I can't use it for that type of service. So if it's after your trademark filing, then you can try to assert your trademark rights. But if they had it before you, you're just out of luck. And would it have anything to do with if they are using that handle for the class that you filed, right? Because if it's for something exactly. completely unrelated, then... Exactly, exactly. This is if it's, yeah, if there's a likelihood of confusion. The trademark sign is a likelihood of confusion. So when we talked before about, you know, potential conflict in the trademark database, we talked about someone using a similar trademark or a similar name on, you know, products or services, it's in connection with what you're doing or something very similar. Um, so it's a likelihood of confusion. The names just have to be similar enough. They don't have to be identical. And the products or services offered just have to be similar or related enough. They don't have to be identical. Okay. So um, Natalie is asking, once you have a trademark, are you able to add another class to that trademark? Right. Uh, great question, Natalie. Once you file your trademark, if you want to add additional classes, you'll have to file a new application. There's no way to add new classes to an existing trademark application. Okay. Um, Let's see. Um, if you, okay, let's see. Jess is asking, if you trademark your brand name, does that include the others from trying to trademark a variation of it? Let's say, for example, your trademark is Moon Man Miami and you're worried someone will trademark Moon Man New York or anything like that. Right. So we just really kind of answered this, but the likelihood of confusion. So if you trademark a name, it would prevent someone from trademarking a similar variation that's likely to be confused with your name uh, for the same types of goods or services. This is the likelihood of confusion standard. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, all righty. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, unless anyone has other trademarking questions. Someone says here, should you file your blog to be a business? That's from Anastasia also. Oh, 
Can you can call me as a business person. Follow <laughs> have your, your blog registered as a business. Have you had a business? Um, I definitely recommend having uh, your blog as a business because uh, you can deduct a bunch of things for when you file your taxes, all your expenses that you use for your business, and just the world takes you more seriously when you are a business. So when you're working with a brand or you're even working with a vendor, if you have, you know, uh, EIN number, which is like the social security number for your company, um, it, uh, it just, people take you more seriously. So I always recommend people who have a blog who are considering not as a hobby, but as a business to definitely make it a, a business. Do you I have absolutely, Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. You know, if, if there's something you should always keep in mind, America was organized to benefit companies and corporations. <laughs> you know, we're seeing that now with this PPP and all the CARES Act and everything happening with the coronavirus relief and stimulus package. You know, this country was built on being able to protect and look out for the interests of businesses. So if you are starting a blog and like you said, thinking about running it, not just as a hobby, but as a business, you're obviously going to have to put some money out to set your company up properly. You're going to have to file taxes and things like that, but you know, you will be taken much more seriously and you get to take advantage of the tax benefits. If you said the write off, the deductions, things like that. Absolutely. And then uh, Joyce Moon is asking where does a DBA fall into play? So <laughs> the DBA is doing business as, and uh, you can, for example, in my case, uh, you can set up, um, your business under a, a name, let's say the blogger union <laughs> is the, the, you set your corporation or your LLC mm -hmm. or whatever as that. And then I, for example, have a bunch of little baby projects that are a different blogs. So I also run Coral Gables Love. So if I want to do business as Coral Gables Love and have people make a check to Coral Gables Love instead of the blogger union, then I open something that's called a DBA. And I think it costs like 60 bucks on sunbiz.org. I'm not sure. It's, um, I think it's less than $100. And it's uh, dollars very affordable. Also called a fictitious name. Yes. And uh, so you can open uh, bank accounts under the DBA and the, people can make you checks to the DBA. So it's just so that you don't have to open a bunch of corporations so that you can do business as all these uh, businesses, but they can all be un under the same umbrella as a, a, the top corporation. Entity. Yeah, that's true. And just a quick uh, kind of side note to that. Uh, just I'll talk really quickly about the differences between a DBA and a trademark. Keep in mind, in most states, DBAs are not exclusive. So more than one entity can have a DBA name. Uh, and that is obviously distinguished from trademarks where only one company can have a trademark name for certain goods or services. So there's a certain amount of exclusivity that comes with a trademark that you do not get with the DBA. You know, there was something that's interesting is when you start to, you go to sunbiz.org to open your, your business uh, in the state of Florida, you can create a corporation under any name. <laughs> Nobody is checking to see if there's a trademark for that name or anything. Can someone go after you if you started a corporation under a name that has been trademarked? Right. Well, in Florida and in most states, unlike DBAs, you're legal. You were saying before about kind of blogger union media or kind of overarching umbrella name. That's your legal entity name. Only one company can have a legal name. So legal entity names are exclusive. DBAs are not. Okay, so. Yeah. so when you file your articles with Sunbiz, if someone has, you know, Minot, my, my firm is called Minot Gore. So if someone already has Minot Gore Inc. or Minot Gore Corp., you cannot register Minot Gore anything because that name is already being used by someone else. Okay, okay, great. Um, so uh, Natalie is asking can someone hold more than one trademark? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Now we're diving into a DBA. <laughs> um, okay, we, let's uh, hold up because we have 15 minutes and if we have time, we can come back to doing business as uh, and look at all those questions. But I did want to talk about FTC disclosures with Serena first. Yeah. And um, can you give us some insights on how we can disclose uh, our sponsorships on our website and our social media and video endorsements? 
Right, certainly, yes. So a few years ago, the FTC uh, decided that, you know, it was important on social media that, you know, you were getting all these people that were posting all these different endorsements for different products without really identifying that this was a paid, you know, testimonial or a paid, com you know, a compensated um, endorsement. And so you do have to disclose if you have received something of value and you're making an endorsement or a post concerning that product or service, you do have to, the FTC does require you to make a clear disclosure that that is a sponsored or advertisement post. Uh, so this is required. You can do it any way you want. You can say it in your caption to say, hey, this was a gift provided to me or a free sample given to me by XYZ company. You can, you know, hashtag sponsored, hashtag, hashtag ad. You can hashtag, you know, Google partner, Google, you know, Canon, you know, associate or ambassador. You know, if you're, you know, having a deal with Canon cameras, for example, but you do clearly have to, you know, indicate to your followers and anybody else that's viewing your content when you have been compensated in some way, shape or form, whether it's a free sample, a free product or an actual, um, you know, real life money. <laughs> deal. <laughs> that's true. You can just look that. I think what uh, really just clarifies this whole issue is like, anyone looking at your content can they just tell easily tell that this was sponsored content so did can people easily tell that you received this meal for free you know and that you're posting it and that your um what you think about the meal you know is still a, a um oh my god i forgot the word <laughs> That, it, <laughs> that it's um i mean it's your honest opinion but you have been compensated for that meal so they have to keep that little grain of salt when they're taking your opinion about that meal or that product that you are promoting so yeah the fpc requirement this does make it you know it, it makes it clear that your expression of endorsement or sponsorship does have to be clear and you know not hidden in the weeds or in the fine print of you know a hundred hashtags and it's like ad is in there somewhere so someone exactly. says there julie holland asks you know does ad or sponsor have to be in the first line not in the first line but it does have to be clearer for example at the end of your caption and not hidden below you know like 10 stars down and hidden into like Right. 15, 16 hashtags. So there are certain uh, um, guidelines. So for example, when uh, FTC was uh, released some guidelines, they were talking about uh, if the caption cuts off, you know, you can put it at the end of the caption, but it has to be before it cuts off. If they have to click to be able to see the full caption and that's where your disclaimer is, then it's not a clear FTC disclaimer because they have to go looking for it. So um, anything like that, you, ha you uh, keep in mind. So for example, people catch a video at different points in time. So if uh, you might have to put video, your disclosure of your sponsorship throughout the video because people might miss it at the very end, at the very beginning, or if you put it at the very end. So just stuff like that. I've seen a lot of influencers put in their um, about me page, a little disclaimer that if they see a little star and the uh, CO, then that means it's an affiliate link. <laughs> uh, and so they just put the little star throughout their whole website. That is very cryptic. Right. <laughs> and, no, no, no. No, no, no. not clear at all so you definitely have to put like these are affiliate links you know i make a commission of this even if the, there is no increase in cost to you i do get a, a commission um and we have to be very clear about our disclosures yes certainly <laughs> uh, obviously instagram you know the various platforms have their own version of you know sponsored, sponsored brand content or you know partner content, um, so brand managers, so there are tools within these uh, platforms themselves, but the FTC does have its own requirements that you use right. uh, that information. So yeah, uh, I heard an attorney also give the advice that that um, if uh, you're using even the, the, spar the partnership tool in Instagram, they would also uh, suggest putting the disclaimer in your caption as well. Certainly, you still have to do that, correct. Yes. 
Okay, so we have a few, we still have a few minutes left, so we can go back to the DBA <laughs> questions. <laughs> so our questions that we said we wanted to discuss, was there anything else that we talked about in terms of your, um, cover, cover in terms of? We have been answering them as we go, so I think we covered most of the stuff, but we have a few DBA questions. So EC is asking, do all DBAs have to be in the same business, like blogging, or can the same company have a DBA for blogging and one for landscaping. Right. So most times when you file your articles with the state, uh, at least when Mike Farm prepares articles, we say that the purpose of the business is for any of any and all legal business purposes. So when we set up the legal entity, which is again, the umbrella company, you can really do any business under that entity. It's not limited to a specific job or industry or anything like that. So, you know, kind of to the question that you're asking, I, I, the name has not gone further up my chat, but you, know, you don't have to say within the same line of business, you can really have a number of different things that you're offering under your DBA. Okay. Your DBAs. That's great. So if you have car washing business and you do blogging, <laughs> get all your DBAs. As a side note, just, I want to stay, you know, on the right side of the law here. If you have different businesses that you're running under various DBAs, however, obviously checking with your accountant and your CPA because all the various revenue streams will ultimately have to be reported on your, you know, whether it's your Schedule K or your uh, tax returns, you'll have to report the income from all the various businesses regardless of what they are. I see. Okay, thank you for the little asterisk. <laughs> so Richard is asking, a news website from Singapore posted a photo of mine with a poor man's copyright. Am I able, am I double out of luck because the copyright wasn't protected and it's foreign? Yeah, that's going to be really tough, Richard, because um, copyrights now, there are, you know, kind of international treaties. So the fact that it's foreign is not really so much the problem. But again, because it wasn't registered and you're relying on a poor man's copyright, it's going to be very difficult for you to enforce that. Okay. At the beginning um, of the court, you said you have to have a registered copyright in order to bring a federal lawsuit. And that's right. Actually, that question is uh, a great question. It brings up, we talk about trademarking within the U.S. What about a worldwide trademark? Does that exist or how would that work? Right. Yeah. So that does not exist. You know, <laughs> trademarks are... <laughs> are regional or geographic in scope. So you do have to apply specifically in the countries in which you want protection. So in the US, you have to apply in the US if you want it in a particular region like the EU, there is an EU uh, IP office that you could file with. But if you want Mexico, you have to apply in Mexico, Canada, same thing. So you do have to apply specifically in the countries in which you want protection. Um, People may have questions about the Madrid protocol. That's something different. Again, that's country specific. There isn't one Madrid protocol application. You do still have to specify the countries in which you want protection because again, the legal fees and the government fees are going to vary by country. So if you want more information, someone did ask for my contact details. We can put the slide up at the end. I don't want to drop it in here because again, I don't know if we're going to get spammed again. I don't want to put my email directly in the mm -hmm. chat. But we will put the flyer up with my contact details. You're welcome to contact me with any questions about international trademarks or really anything about what we talked about. Yes, I, if you want, I can include your contact information when I send the email to all the registrants oh, to this perfect. webinar with the replay, the link to the replay. Perfect, um, yeah. So that way you can contact Serena with all your questions or if you want to trademark your company. Um, okay, we have a, a couple more questions. Uh, LaPorta is asking, what's the difference between TEAS plus and standard? Right. So the trademark office uh, gives you a couple different base, you know, kind of options to file your trademark. There's the TEAS standard and TEAS plus. And really the big difference is the filing fee. So the government filing fee for TEAS standard is the 275 that we talked about. And for certain qualifying applications, you may be able to file under the TEAS plus which is kind of a, a shortened version of the application. There are a few different qualifications to get onto the TEAS Plus. It does have the benefit of a reduced filing fee, that's 225. The biggest uh, determinant of whether or not you can file on TEAS Plus or standard is whether or not your products or services are kind of already set in the database. You know, with your trademark applications, and we specify what the products or services are. If your products or services are kind of already preset into the database, 
you will likely fall into TEAS plus. There's a few other requirements as well. Um, but the biggest one is whether or not your goods or services are preset. So if you're doing clothing, easy, you're preset. You'd like to get on the TEAS plus, provided you meet the other qualifications. If you're doing a software that's very complicated and I have to craft a specific description for your software, you're probably gonna have to be on the standard, which is uh, gonna be at that higher filing fee. Okay, so Chris is asking a question about uh, um, um, FTC disclosures again, I'm guessing. Um, he talks of, he's asking, how does this work? I'm guessing FTC disclosures for Amazon affiliates page on your blog. So if you have a little shop on your blog that are all links to, that go to Amazon, all you have to do is at the top of the page, put that these links are affiliate links and you're set. <laughs> uh, you have something to add? No, I have nothing to add. Uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> So um, let's see. I've seen images with a copyright notice in the caption. Is that totally invalid? If you, you cannot use the circle R unless you have a registered, just, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, the circle R for a registered trademark and you cannot use the circle C unless you have a registered copyright. So the registered symbol, which is whether it's the C in the circle or the R in the circle, is for content that has been registered with either the Copyright Office or the US Patent and Trademark Office. So if you put it on your stuff and you don't actually have it registered, it's essentially invalid. It does put people on notice, but really you're not allowed to use that symbol until you have something actually registered with the government. Oh. Which really quickly brings me to Richard. C has a question, do I have to put the TM on everything? The TM is a way in which you can let people know you're claiming trademark rights in something without having a federal trademark. Um, so you can use TM from now until the cows come home. There's no limitations on who can use TM if you're trying to claim trademark rights in something, but you cannot use the R in the circle, the register symbol, or the C in the circle for copyrights until you have it registered. I see. Well, that's very interesting because all of our blog templates bring the little copyright already preset in red. <laughs> so we should not be using that unless we officially trademarked our content. Yes. So copy. question, can you use the C if you just trademark a photo and there's also a bunch of other stuff there that hasn't been copywritten? You want to attach the copyright symbol to whatever it is that has been copyright. So if it's only the image, you want to attach it to the image. A lot of people do use that C in the circle symbol though, you know, and they're not supposed to, but a lot of people do use it. But yes, when it, came, when it comes to actually enforcing, then you're gonna find that it really was for naught. It doesn't work for anything, <laughs> okay, because <laughs> you didn't actually <laughs> copyright. Right? I see, okay. Um, so, uh, so I, we just answered Vivian's question. <laughs> So um, I think this is the last question from Natalie. And you, you spoke about international trademark. If I need to file a lawsuit, would I need to do it in the country, I guess, that, uh, that is infringing your trademark? Yes, that's correct. OK. Well, your that US trademark is only good in the US. You know, even Apple has run into problems in China, you know, where someone already had iPhone registered before them and they had to fight for it. Just because you're a company as big as Apple doesn't mean that you just get to show up and say, hey, give me the iPhone trademark if someone already has a trademark. So that's going to be a regional dispute in that country. Wow. Oh, okay. Well, it's good to, if you guys ha grow into international empires, now you know what you have to do. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, um, I want to thank you so much, Serena, for coming here and sharing your insights with our members. Um, I learned so much. <laughs> um, and do you have anything you'd like to share, promote, for them to go find you? Sure. Um, yeah, if you, I don't have really anything to promote. If you need an attorney, I'm happy to talk to you. We do offer free consultations. I am still sheltering in place. So if you want to reach out to me, you know, it's, you know, you might hear um, my children's footsteps running around somewhere in the background, but no, we're here, we're working.